Hello, everyone from beautiful Southern Ohio. Uh, my name is Paul Dorrance, and it's my distinct pleasure to present this keynote address on the topic of quality. I know I might be somewhat biased, but when you consider barn doors four levers of success, I think it's clear that quality is by far the most important. You can build an amazing brand, but without quality, your sales will fall short. Your price can vary greatly, but as long as you have quality there to support it. And convenience is indeed king in this world today, but only quality truly underpins, supports, and enables your success in the world of food and agriculture. Before I jump too far ahead, let me introduce myself. I was not a farmer from the beginning, although I definitely grew up country in the hills of upstate New York. I actually spent the first 12 years of my post-college career as an active duty Air Force pilot, flying three different types of aircraft over that 12 year span. During most of this time, I considered myself quote unquote normal as far as food consumers go. And normal for mine means that I didn't care where the food came from. I made fun of the term organic and in general, I trusted the system to provide the food at my convenience. It was only when my ex-wife got pregnant with our firstborn child that my views on food started to change. I mean, I was scared to death. I wanted to do what was right for that baby growing inside her. And so I began to read and explore and research all sorts of things, but most critical to our conversation today, food. What I found through that research scared me even more than becoming a first time dad. I found deception in the way that food was labeled and marketed. I found collusion between large multinational corporations and government organizations who were supposed to represent and protect consumers like me. And I found outright aggression towards those who would dare opt out or choose a different path for themselves or their families. I looked back at my life from that point and wondered, how could I have been so blind? And then I turned 180 degrees opposite and became one of those weird folks who chose differently. I began to seek out organic and local foods, support the farmers in my surrounding communities. And I found myself now deeply valuing what I had previously taken for granted. Fast forward four years, and it was very clear to me that my active duty lifestyle and I were done with each other. I now had two young children and a third on the way, and I wanted to provide a more stable upbringing for all of them. I began to think about what might be next for me after the Air Force, and I knew the answer in my gut. It was time to put my money where my mouth was, literally, and begin producing this type of food for others that I had begun to seek out for myself. So in 2013, I found 111 acres on forsalebyowner.com, and I started my pasture-based livestock operation from scratch. For the next seven years, pastured Providence Farmstead raised and sold grass-fed and finished beef and lamb, as well as pastured non-GMO pork, poultry, including turkey for Thanksgiving, and eggs. Almost all of my products were sold directly to consumers via on-farm sales or various farmer's markets, or custom cut by the half and whole animal. I did have one regular restaurant customer, and I served as their exclusive ground beef provider for a number of years. When my divorce was finalized earlier this year, uh, I found myself at a crossroads. I was running a one-man show that needed at least two people's efforts to thrive, and so I made the heartbreaking decision to sell my livestock, pursue commercial haymaking in the short term, and figure out how to continue to support others in their agricultural enter uh, enterprises and pursuits. I now envision a future for myself where I'm able to educate, encourage, and equip others for even greater success than my operation enjoyed as a consultant, author, speaker, and good food advocate. And it's from that perspective that I humbly speak in front of you today. When I have the opportunity to teach business planning to young and beginning farmers, one of the first things that I emphasize is the concept that values should always come first. Once you have your values identified, they then inform and shape your subsequent goals, enterprises, and overall agricultural operation. It's the aspect of quality in our values that keeps us from falling into the trap of cutting corners. Without quality values, all human beings are prone to cheat or take shortcuts. But I think this is especially true within the world of agriculture. Agriculture, more than any other occupation that I'm aware of, has the ability to test our mettle and challenge our perceptions. In short, this lifestyle is tough. And Aaron Tippett said it best when he's saying, you've got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. And of course, there's plenty of amazing moments and seasons cradled within this lifestyle. However, in my experience, it's when the literal manure hits the fan that I need to be reminded of my values. And that makes sense, right? 
we generally don't need our values or our bedrock principles when things are going great. Generally speaking, our values become critical in the heartache, in the trauma, and in the emergency. And it's important to recognize that farming has way more of those than other occupants. I used to joke with friends that I would wake up in the morning on this gorgeous day, stretch long and hard and wonder to myself what emergency the farm was gonna throw at me that day. Was it gonna be a sick animal or maybe a predator running rampant? Oh no, no, I know what it is. I was planning to bale hay that day, so it will definitely be some sort of broken machinery. And then after coffee and morning chores, I'd be walking back up towards the house and just then see the geyser venting up from the ground, like, ah, there it is, a ruptured water line. I did not see that one coming, but I never doubted that it was coming. Sometimes I woke up to the emergency, sometimes I went to sleep exhausted after dealing with it, but it was always lurking. Who else but farmers would sign up for this kind of perpetual stress and difficulty? But one of the unique and enjoyable things about farming compared to other occupant, uh, occupations is that we generally get to call the shots and make decisions. Not always, Mother Nature and the good Lord always have the final say, but more than other jobs, we often get to chart our own path. It's likely one of the attributes that brings you to this lifestyle. The trap here is that there is usually no one watching when we're tempted to cut corners, take the easy way out and cheat the system. Without or sometimes in spite of our values, this represents a real struggle. For example, Early one spring, as I wrestled with the reality that my cattle were dealing with mites, which are little critters that cause skin irritations, hair loss, and stress, the cattle were patchy, ugly, and ornery, and I suppose I would have been too if I were them. The normal or easy way to combat mites is to use a chemical poron that kills pretty much everything. Fleas, ticks, lice, internal worms, and yes, mites. It is also extremely harmful to the environment, gets excreted in the manure and kills earthworms, dung beetles, and a multitude of beneficial creatures in your pasture. Even knowing that, I succumbed to the lie that it was too much trouble to dust the cattle with diatomaceous earth, or too expensive to run out and buy a scratching post to allow the animals to remove the mites themselves. Instead, I went against my values, I treated with ivermectin, and in that one moment of weakness, I single-handedly wiped out every dung beetle on my property for the next three years. After that, my values formally included that I would never use a product that isn't specifically authorized by USDA organic standards, even though I'm not certified organic. This was an easy way for me to draw a line in the sand, communicate value to my customers, and elevate my values above the temptation of taking the easy way out. Knowing your values, and equally as important, writing them down, gives your business strength, vision, and power. The only way we farmers can stand in the face of isolation, risk, and tragedy that's part of our day-to-day -day life is to cling to our values, and they have to be identified and codified before they are needed. In the middle of the difficulty is the wrong time to determine what we stand for. We're too weak and fallible for that. When the cattle were in the chute that spring day, that was the wrong time for me to decide whether chemical treatments were right for me or not. We have to realize that our goals and our plans must be built on a foundation of quality values. Only then can we farm to our full potential, communicate accurately with our customer base, and mitigate the troubling times that farming will certainly bring our way. And with our foundations, value foundations specifically firmly in place, we are best equipped to care for our ground. Normally, we think that quality starts with products, but I think we need to think bigger than that. In fact, I actually think we need to think smaller than that. Before customer interactions come or products get listed for sale, quality starts beneath our feet. As farmers, we follow a high calling. When I describe this concept to myself and others, the words that I seem to gravitate towards are uh, feel ancient or old world. Words like caretaker, steward, and partner. My tagline for the farmstead was that I partner with creation to produce healthy food. And I love that. So let's go back to the stewardship one for an, uh, and concentrate on that. By definition, the word stewardship means to be responsible for, maintain order, to look after and to care for. Doesn't that sound like the force that drives us? Doesn't that sound like a concept that should be grounded on a foundation of quality? Quality stewardship practices result in good soil and imply an intimate relationship with our ground. And I know that might seem ephemeral, so let's take a look at what that looks like in practice. 
obviously there's lots of sources for this kind of guidance, but today I'm going to go to the good book and read from Mark 4, verses 3 through 8, which is the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower goes like this. Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they were withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which, fell, uh, which grew up excuse me, and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on, and here it is, good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Noah Sanders, in his book, Born Again Dirt, which I highly recommend, answers the question, what does good soil look like? His answer, directly from the book, says that, and he comes up with four attributes uh, for good soil. Loose, deep, weed-free, and living. Noah writes, in the parable of the sower, we saw that the compacted soil of the path was not suitable for growing. We also see in creation that plants grow better in soil that is loose, not hard. This allows space for water and air in the soil that is necessary for drainage, roots, and soil life. Therefore, good soil should not be compacted and should be loose. We also see in the parable of the sower that the shallow soil was not good because it didn't allow the plant's roots to go deep and they died from lack of water. Deep soil allows the roots of the plants to reach down and access water in the soil below the drier surface. Deep soil also allows for more water to be stored in the soil rather than running off. Therefore, good soil should be deep. The third place the seed in the parable was sown was among the thorns. These weeds competed for water and nutrients and choked the plants. Many times weeds don't kill the plants that were growing, but their competition causes them to be unfruitful. Therefore, good soil should be relatively weed-free. And contrary to what most of us would think, good soil isn't just a ser sterile growing medium that is dark in color. No, if you go and look at the rich soil in the woods, you'll see that it's crawling with life. These microorganisms break down raw materials in the soil and make them available to the plants. Without the life in the soil, plants will not be as healthy as they might be because they can't access very many nutrients. In scripture, we see that life is good and death is bad, so I, and this is Noah speaking, believe that good soil would indicate soil with life in it. Therefore, good soil should be living. By ensuring quality in our stewardship practices, we can ensure that we are working with good soil healthy soil, living soil. Have you ever stopped to think about soil as healthy or living or even as an organism in general? Well cared for soil is teeming with life. A single handful contains millions of living organisms, everything from fungi and bacteria and nematodes that we can't see to earthworms and beetles and centipedes that we can. If this is true and we have accepted the calling to steward the life on our farm, then the obvious question becomes, how do we care for these millions of organisms beneath our feet? Well, my answer to the question is to go back what any living animal needs to survive, food, water, shelter, and I will add rest. So let's think about that for a minute. Food, for the soil food web beneath our feet, the basis of food is organic matter, decomposing carbon. So we kind of have this issue where we have a choice to make, we can either feed those organisms naturally with what they what they normally get? Or what do we take an artificial approach and, and attempt to simulate that food in some sort of nature through a chemical approach? And water, as Noah mentioned in the book, it, the way that we avoid water uh, issues and we provide water for those living organisms is by avoiding compaction. That allows not only the water to sink in instead of flowing across a, a field or pasture or ground, but it allows the actual roots and the structure of the soil itself to capture that water, release it slowly, and use it in times of need. And shelter. We should strive to always have something growing at all times in our ground and avoid at all costs bare soil, whether that's perennial pasture, whether that's a cover crop, or mulch. There are a multitude of ways that we can do that, but we need to provide shelter for the living organisms beneath our feet. And then finally, rest. We know rest is good for humans. I don't function very well without it, uh, but it's also good for the land. 
we need to work in within a normal crop rotation, a period of being fallow, whether that's a season or a year. In that fallow, that, that rest allows natural processes to take place that which rejuvenate and energize the, uh, the microorganisms uh, in the soil. I believe ultimately resting our land counterintuitively allows land to be more productive than if we continue to push it in production. Ensuring quality soil allows us to produce, excuse me, allows us to pursue production of a quality product. On my farm, I ensure food, water, shelter, and rest for my soil using rotationally grazing uh, perennial pasture. I like to call grass the original cover crop. Before cover crops were sexy and before no-till was a thing, there was grass. In fact, the grassland biome covers 30 to 40% of Earth's surface. Quality grass management offers a multitude of benefits. First and foremost, perennial pasture, pasture maintains and ensures constant roots in the soil at all times. I may harvest the top of the um, above surface, whether it's mechanical harvest via hay or, or uh, harvest with the animals, but the root structure below ground, constant all the time, uh, adjusting and correcting and, and growing, um, which as we've already mentioned, captures and slows water um, uh, across it. And it also provides a constant shelter for those uh, organisms beneath the soil. Uh, animal impact has a huge piece on, on my farm, which honestly kind of has a bad rap uh, these days. And it's because uh, normal animal impact when viewed uh, adds to compaction, adds to um, negative disturbance, but animal impact in a rotational grazing scenario, not only do they manure and feed the animals directly, uh, but they also smash down and crush what they don't eat, which uh, increases carbon soil contact and accelerates the process uh, of feeding uh, the microbiome in the soil. And there is such a thing as beneficial disturbance, hoof pressure in action uh, almost in, in some sense tills and, and activates the soil beneath it, as long as it's not done over a long period of time, which comes to the third thing that I wanted to talk about, which is rotational grazing. Rotational grazing takes that beneficial animal impact and moves it across a certain piece of land, but does not allow the negative aspects of animal impact to take place. So I don't have the compaction associated with animals coming to the same tree every single day to shelter from the sun and compacting the area around it. I don't have the pathways through the fields where the animals select uh, where they go and so you end up with this severe compaction routes across a continuously grazed pasture. Instead, my land is allowed to have the, the beneficial impact of the animals and then the rest that comes after it. And it also mitigates things like parasites. Um, all of the, the manure gets left behind and you move uh, animals onto a clean set of pasture every single day in my case. And so you don't have that issue that I mentioned before where um, I had to fall prey to uh, using chemical adjustments for, for parasites. Now, rotational grazing uh, does that for me. Next, I want to talk about diversity. Diversity is recognized as beneficial in all sorts of different areas, including finances and investing. Why not agriculture? My friend Will Harris said it best when he said, nature abhors a monoculture. And this has multiple uh, different uh, iterations on my farm, both forage and livestock. By having a diversity of forage species, I better utilize uh, the grass by use by different animals. So my cattle will eat certain things, the sheep will eat something totally different. And so I'm able to better utilize my forage overall because of the diversity of species. And the diversity addresses a seasonal slump that I have to deal with. For example, if I had all cool season perennials right now, um, as we approach the end of July and into August with 90 degree days, uh, the, that forage is gonna go dormant. Um, but because I have a wide diversity of, of forage types, I have warm season perennials that are coming up as well. So as the um, sun plants go dormant, the others are just coming into their own. And so you have this concept of, of addressing seasonality and, and temperature differences and climatic issues with diversity of forage species. And then I also have a multi-species uh, livestock operation and those synergies are so cool to think about. I have a flirt where ca cattle and sheep, as you can see in this picture, are uh, run together. And cattle, if they ingest a sheep parasite internally, that parasite dies inside them. If a sheep ingests a, a parasite that would typically uh, bother the cattle, 
that parasite dies inside the sheep. They are end hosts for each other's parasites. How cool is that? And in general, you get better forage utilization. In fact, listen up, cattle people who don't have sheep. You can add one ewe for every cow on your operation for free. No adjustment in operation, no change in paddock size, and that is solely because you, the animals select and utilize different forage species within your existing pasture. So you get better overall utilization of your pasture and more livestock uh, pressure and more livestock uh, per acre. Uh, I use poultry to follow my flirt, and so I not only do they add their own manure, but they also spread the manure of the large ruminants that went ahead of them. So I don't have to worry about mechanical um, uh, spreading manure. I don't have to harrow. I don't have to run equipment to, to clean up those pastures. And those uh, chickens are eating fly larva, uh, which reduces pest pressure and disease potential within my herd. These are just some of the things that, uh, that I uh, take advantage of through multi-species synergies because of this overall concept of diversity. And then finally, one of the last benefit that I wanted to talk about from a grass perspective is the seasonality. So for me in Southern Ohio, April, May, and June are just this gorgeous, lush pasture full of clovers and, and, uh, and high energy forages. And that's what I finish my grass finished animals, uh, beef and lamb together uh, on in that sort of rush of amazing um, uh, forage. So I'll finish those animals on what I call the cow candy. And then when they all get processed at, um, towards the end of July or August time frame, as that forage begins to decrease in, in value, uh, it's okay because I'm now only breeding, uh, excuse me, maintaining my breeding herd at that point. So I'm able to work within the seasonality of the structure because of that. So grass for me is the foundation of my products quality that my customers are seeking. They're seeking non-chemical. They're seeking grass finished. They're seeking humanely raised products. So grass is my answer, but it's not the only one. You need to find what answer is, is uh, available to you, whether that's cover cropping, uh, especially if you're using mechanical termination instead of a chemical um, termination of that cover crop, or maybe you're pursuing uh, or transitioning to organic in terms of grains and fruits and vegetables. Whatever your product, ultimately quality must be foundational to our farm businesses. It's it provides an alternative to fast and cheap. Our food tastes better and is way more nutritious. Our customers are demanding it, and that allows us to take advantage of and provide a market differentiation. But more importantly, I believe we must demand it of ourselves and strive for quality on principle alone, because quality impacts, affects, and is intertwined with all aspects of our farming efforts. Our values need to be rooted in quality. Our stewardship should be driven by quality. Our soil health is cared for with quality and our products will be recognizable because of the quality that was in them. No matter whether we've been farming for five years, five months or 50 years, we can all make quality the foundation for our business. We need to keep our values strong, firm and front and center in both our strategic and operational decisions. Out of the power of our values, we'll be better able to steward our land, to love and care for it, along with the millions of organisms that call our soil home. And it will be because of that love and care that we show our soil, that our farm products will be recognized by consumers across the globe for their ecological production methods, amazing taste, and superior nutritional value. Thank you so much to the attendees of the Direct 2020 Conference for your attention and for making the time to attend this conference virtually. Thank you to Barn to Door for all of their work putting this conference together and for asking me to keynote on this very important topic. And thank you to Yank Acres USA for connecting me with Barn to Door and for allowing this opportunity to take hold. Uh, that reminds me, Acres USA is developing online courses uh, which are available on a multitude of topics. The one that I'm writing is called Proven Lessons for Success in the Business of Farming. As I mentioned at the beginning, my new vision for Pasture Province is to encourage and educate and equip both new and seasoned farmers for success in pasture-based livestock. I have consulting options available, and if that's anything that would be beneficial to you in your future operations, please visit my website, pastureprovidence.com, for more details. Again, thank you so much for your time. Let's all strive to make quality the foundation of our business, driving our success in the world of food and agriculture.